please check out the Night Dreams Talk Radio website at www.nightdreamstalkradio.com. Also, if you want to keep our show free of advertising, just hit the donate button. Give a buck or two. Remember, all prior shows are always free to listen to. We at Night Dreams Talk Radio thank you for your support. All right. Well, we are back, ladies and gentlemen, all you night dreamers out there. Uh, and this is Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer again. Uh, we're going to be on for the next hour with the most fascinating radio show you might have seen or heard. So uh, I have an interesting guest on tonight, and we are going to be talking about, well, first of all, let me introduce him by name. It's uh, Dr. Stephen Pigeon. He is a um, a Ph.D. in uh, psychology as well as an attorney practicing in the state of Washington. But he is also a um, sacred scripture scholar. So we are in for a treat tonight because we are going to talk about everything paranormal in sacred scriptures. And I'm looking forward to this. So, um, Stephen, are you on the air with us at this point? Yes, I am, Michael. I'm coming from you. I'm coming to you from an undisclosed location <laughs> in the northeastern corner of the state of Washington. Oh, perfect. You even pinpointed the, the corner of the, of the state. That's good for you. You know, Peter Davenport, one of my longtime clients, I actually helped him purchase uh, an abandoned Nike missile site in eastern Washington where, where he uh, has dreamed always of uh, putting his uh, National UFO Reporting Center database deep underground in this uh, 80-foot down survive a uh, nuclear blast. So I think that's great. And, and of course, as people uh, know me as the uh, paranormal lawyer, uh, I remember the last time we spoke, you, you mentioned that you actually operate the paranormal law firm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, isn't that the truth, Michael? Isn't that the truth? You know, we do only unusual things in my law firm, uh, crazy stuff, really. But it's always an adventure, you know, because you never know what's going to come through the door. And uh, now now the kind of practice I do, believe it or not, everybody in my office speaks almost only Russian. And so it's kind of crazy because I don't speak Russian, so it's a, kind of a difficult issue, but it's fun. Oh, my goodness, yeah. But uh, you do have... Uh... Uh, a background in other languages, including Hebrew, obviously. Uh, so yes, yeah, uh, that must be very interesting for you uh, to have a well, it is. Like it is, and it's uh, it's really it's very good because in the practice that I do, we have our finger on the pulse of what is going on uh, throughout the world, and oh, uh, yeah. so we get to, we get kind of inordinate information information you wouldn't otherwise hear what we would call human tell human intelligence from feet yeah. on the ground that are people that are not engaged in intelligence work. Right. Well, and um, there is just a massive uh, Russian contingent uh, in the Northwest anyway. So I would imagine you're keeping yourself busy in that regard. Oh yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, we're kind of running into a uh, very, very uh, smart people very well-educated people, very smart people. So it's good to work with them. And, of course, they love being in America. Oh, and, I'll bet. Uh, yeah, that's wonderful. So I hear the phrase quite often, you're in America now. We do things a little different here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> so, in other words, they're, they're mentioning that, that, that you do things a little differently here. Yeah, they're mentioning it, yeah. And yeah. it's it's very good because we even had some visitors come over from Russia, and I asked them, I said, okay, you're in America now, you can speak freely, <laughs> and tell me what's really going on. You know? Yeah, right. And, of course, yeah. they, they probably really don't understand the uh, attorney-client privilege of confidentiality and those kinds of things. I, I'll bet they have a lot of, uh, of course, with uh, I, what I've heard about the KGB in the old days, you know, infiltrating even neighborhoods and stuff, telling them folks so. 
Oh yeah, the KGB, and of course now it's all electronic surveillance, right? So yeah. when uh, they they hear literally every word you say, and you know, I went into a hotel once in in Moscow, and I'd never been in a Russian hotel before. And so I go into the hotel and they said, okay, give us your passport. I was uneasy about doing that. And yeah. they gave me a card back and said, now you can take this card and you can get on that elevator over there by that security guard. So, I mean, I literally walked from the front desk to the elevator and he could watch me doing it. No card, no elevator. Right? <laughs> and so I presented my card. He says, okay, you can go to the 12th floor. You know, So we go up on the 12th floor and we come around the corner. And we come into this woman that they call the Dejournaya, okay, which is the gal who sleeps right there. And she works like a 24-hour shift. So she's there for 24 hours. And she's sitting at this desk with a set of headphones on. And she's plugging it in, you know, this room now, that room later. You know. <laughs> oh, what is it? oh, oh it's, it's that blatant, in other words. It's that blatant, that obvious. Oh, man. Wow. Um, yeah. that's fascinating. Thank you for that, uh, uh, tidbit of international travel. Of course, things I'm sure have changed, uh, periodically over there now recently, but still, uh, you know, as Americans, if we, uh, if we travel to other countries, it's not like back home. We don't have the rights that we think we have, you know, when we travel worldwide. So that's fascinating stuff. Oh, so true. In fact, uh, you know, in Eastern Europe, you have no rights as a pedestrian. So if you if you step off the curb, you know they can run you down and then put a little notch in their dashboard. You know that's another one. You know. Oh, yeah, I'll bet. No, do they do they drive on the same side of the road as we do, or is it like in England or Europe? Well, you know when you're talking about Russia trying to claim there's a side to the road is an interesting argument. <laughs> okay, so it really doesn't matter. You got to be careful. Well, listen. Um, <laughs> We we only have an hour show tonight, so I am just pleased as punch that you've been able to uh, I've been able to track you down and get you back on our show uh, to talk about some of the amazing expertise that you've got in sacred scriptures. You might want to give just a short uh, introduction of you know how you obtained your expertise and uh, education in this regard. That'd be fun for people to hear. Yeah, sure. I mean, what happened is. About uh, 10 years ago, uh, some friends of mine, we, we had been in an in intense Bible study, and we were having a great deal of discussion about particular nuances of Scripture, and I turned to a couple of friends of mine who were very knowledgeable, and I said, you know, we need to take a closer look at this and see if we can start, you know, exploring what's actually here. And so we did, and what we found was absolutely incredible. And so we have been publishing scripture now since uh, 2012. And so I've had the opportunity to read through uh, the text. And, of course, we published the Et Sefer, which is a 87-book collection of sacred scripture in the English language. Wow. And let me make sure that we make that uh, spelling correct for the folks. It's Et Sefer, right? Like uh, E-T and then a separate word, C-E-P-H-E-R. C-E-P-H-E-R, yeah, and it's a C-E-P-H-E-R dot net is our website, separate dot net. Okay. And, uh, and so you can get this book. Well, what we have discovered, I mean, when you start looking at these books, one book that we looked at and that we've actually published in this collection is the book of Enoch. Oh, yeah. Now, Enoch, you know, this book, when this book was first published, people were saying, okay, that book's crazy. Right. And in fact... When you read the book now, of course, because we have the advantage of having seen Hubble Space telegraph, Telescope photos, having seen um, you know a lot of things that, as we've been able to explore outer space, we begin to see things that Enoch described in his book. Oh and, man! Oh yeah, it's incredible, and you know, and, and there's this there's this discussion that you can find actually in the book of Hebrews that says, and Enoch was translated. Now, when you see that word translated, that doesn't mean he was converted into another language. Yeah. He yeah, was trans, right. He was, he was translated out of this dimension into another dimension. Oh man. And 
you have discussions like this about uh, this, you know, Elijah as well being translated. And then there's other discussion about being translated. Like, for instance, when Isaiah says, I saw the kingdom, right? I saw the throne. Well, if you saw the throne, you didn't see it here. You saw it in heaven. If you saw the throne in heaven, then you had to have been translated. Well, there you go. Yeah, and, and what uh, what about John the Revelator, right? Uh, John the just, Revelator, another one? Sitting in uh, the island of Patmos, and all of a sudden he's out of his body or whatever it is that he's uh, describing. That This is fascinating stuff. So you, you know, and, and by the way, these are the things that when you go and get a, uh, even a great pastor, you know, speaking about the history of the Bible or the Old or New Testament, you don't really hear the in-depth stories like you're talking about. They never do. In fact, almost this is almost never discussed in the typical church, because you're raising issues that really kind of cannot be answered. Paul says, I knew a guy that was translated to the third heaven 14 years ago. Oh, well, that's interesting when he says that, because he's probably talking about himself. <laughs> You know, and he says, I translated to the third heaven. All right, well, we've got a couple of things to deal with there. One is, apparently, there's three heavens. Yeah, right. And and he got translated to the third one. So what does this translated mean, right? This translated. So you have this idea that somehow in Scripture you're saying there are things here that are not readily understood by today's science. Today's science, we have to be able to do a, you know, an experiment based upon a hypothesis, replicate the experiment in order to come up with some kind of theory. But in this case, we're seeing that, in fact, you have something that took place. You have a couple of witnesses that it took place to more than one individual. And yet, how do you, how do you comprehend this as a person? You were translated into another dimension. Now, we know that there's other dimensions. In fact, right. I would argue, I'd argue, Michael, that if you go back to, you know, uh, the age right after Noah and so forth, if you look at the artwork, the artwork appears all two-dimensional. You know, it's very much like uh, kind of looking at a cartoon. There's yeah. no depth perception in the artwork. Right. And I think, I think it has to do with the mental mindset. It has to do with the spiritual awakening. So I believe people saw the world really as a two-dimensional world because of the level of cognition they had yeah but when but but when you increase the cognition you're capable of understanding the third dimension and you do in fact see the third dimension now would that be uh represented by the only thing i can think of is uh some of these uh rock art that have been uh discovered with uh they're they're like a spiral circle would would that be something uh, emerging as far as a different dimension uh, recognition in people's psyche at that point? Yeah, you start to see this idea of a little bit of depth perception. Yeah. You start to see it in sculpture. You know, like if you look at this old symbol that shows up in the Hebrew, which is the menorah. Right. When you see the menorah, 